I, th I think most recently I started to see a spike um, along my band scope around every 10 kilohertz. And uh, I could not figure out what it was. And I still actually haven't exactly pinpointed it, but uh, I've done a lot of work to, to narrow it down. But um, originally I thought it was AM broadcast interference. And uh, so what I had done is I did a couple of things. One is I found it much, much easier to kind of troubleshoot and track down uh, these particular spikes or birdies or sometimes what they call them. I've seen every 10K. Obviously, I could see them on my 7300 and it was visible to me. But when I used my um, SDR, it became a lot more visible and easier to track. And with my SDR, I could kind of zoom in a little bit more and I could mm. look at much you... larger slices mm. of bandwidth. Because you got um, that waterfall view, don't you? So you can see everything all in one yes. go. Yep. Yep. And then I could see that whatever I was seeing, like the signal seemed to get weaker as it went further and further up in frequency. To the point where I was around 10 or 12, 10 meters, it really wasn't an issue. But one of the things I noticed when I was using my SDR to listen on um, 11 meters, this, this, the Freedom Band, uh, I could hear AM radio stations every certain, uh, every, every in, in spaces. So what I was thinking is, is that, well, what must be causing my problem would be AM broadcast uh, issues. So in uh, the U.S., AM channels are usually spaced around 10K apart. So you can, when you go down to the AM band, you can, you can, uh, you can see them. And so I figured that, I figured that's what it was. And I bought something called a band stop and I just had it in my hands earlier. Here it is. And uh, this is called a band stop. And this is a model M400X. And what you can see on here is it only lets through 3.5 uh, megahertz to uh, somewhere around the top end of 50, 54, something like that. 300 watts, 50 ohms. And I thought that by putting this on, my, my problems were going to be solved. Mm. And I put it on, and they weren't. But it did clean up some of the interference that I was getting. I was definitely getting... AM interference, especially if I could hear it uh, as a harmonics further up the band. So this did help, but it didn't it didn't cure my uh, my problem. Even though you thought that it was the uh, the AM broadcaster, um, and you you obviously put the band stop filter in, and it it didn't didn't make uh, didn't make a difference. Right. What what um, other steps? did you then take to try and and rectify it once you realize okay so it's not that then what did you do well i did what what uh, we're supposed to do when we first see interference um the, the thing is that when hams have qrm problems or rfi problems or emi problems it's almost always a collection of things it's 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 almost always more than one thing that's causing you problems so like like i said my this did help with my noise floor and it did help with noise but it didn't solve my problem of the uh, peaks every 10k <clears throat> so what i did is i went to, uh, and started turning stuff off room by room i started with my ham shack so my ham shack i've got a beer fridge like every other good ham right so the first thing i did is i unplugged my pl unplugged that didn't make a difference which you kind of <clears> hope <throat> that that's not the problem because you don't want to have that yeah <laughs> Yeah, and um, I actually use a surge protector uh, to plug in some of my equipment that is an RF quiet surge protector. It's made by a MFJ and it's supposed to have filtering in there. So I made sure everything was running through that and uh, it, it it didn't help. And because I record in here YouTube videos, I had to went through it. I made all my cameras were off and I had to turn all the lights off and I did all that. No, no difference at all. So one of the things I thought it may be was the... Um, antenna was is picking up some sort of uh radiation or maybe it was my coax so what i wanted to do is i went outside and i disconnected the antenna and i put a dummy load on the end of my coaxial cable so that way if the coaxial cable which was running in between my house and my air conditioning unit so I thought that maybe my air conditioning unit would kick on and then that's what would cause this problem. And it wasn't, it wasn't that. So when I, when I put the dummy load on the antenna, then I had no, I had no signal coming in at all. Nothing, no interference. Now what's interesting is, is that with the SDR, when I was watching it, at one point there was no interference at all. And then all of a sudden the interference kicked on. 
And I think actually maybe I was even talking to you, and I think that's why I, we, we decided to go out there and put that dummy load on to see if it was the coax that was running past the antenna. And, and it was, and it was the same thing. And I went outside in the backyard with the um, tiny SA spectrum analyzer, which has a really short antenna. And I put it on there, and I'm walking all around trying to figure out, you know, is, is, am I going to figure out what it is? And I, I didn't. I didn't find anything. Now, oddly enough, my spectrum analyzer in the house connected to the antenna does not pick it up. So I, so I didn't know what that was. So I started to do the process of going through the house and shutting things off uh, that I suspected, right? Like I'm like, my, my daughter has LED lights that go around her room. And I'm like, that's got to be it. That has got to be it. And so I go in there and I, and I turn them off. And we have a uh, lamp downstairs that's part of like this plant thing. So when you turn it on, the plants like light up. And I'm like, that's got to be it. Because one time, a long time ago, I was working on the radio, and then all of a sudden, my noise floor jumped a couple of S units with, with my sound floor went up. Like, what the heck was that? And, I, you know, I ran in the other room and to my wife said, what did you just turn on? I didn't turn on anything. I'm like, well, you had to turn on something. You did something. And, she, and she's like, I didn't. So I came back in, I'm looking at the radio, and all of a sudden, it goes away. So I run in and I say, what did you just do? And I didn't do anything. <laughs> I'm like, you did something. And it turns out she was charging her iWatch. So uh, when she plugged uh, her iWatch in, and I think I might be breaking up here. Is my signal okay? Yeah, it's okay. Um, so when she would plug in the iWatch, it, it, it did have some impact. So that's the kind of thing I was going through the house looking for. And, you know, I, I finally broke down when my family wasn't home and I decided to turn off the the mains power. But before I did that, I took my, my main rig and I disconnected it completely from the power source and, and tested it on a battery still still had the the signal so it wasn't anything coming in via the power the ups or anything because that's one of the things a lot of people say is well how do you know your ups isn't causing you issues I went straight up battery and i uh, still still had the problem so when i finally turned the 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 house off problem running the station on the battery the problem went away Fun, funny story though about lighting um on uh, there must be there must be a brand of sensor light which is susceptible to uhf frequencies because i used to be able to drive up my road and all of the houses were very similarly constructed from a similar year so they all had sensor lights out the front so mm. you'd go transmitting up the up the road from the vehicle using 50 watts on on uhf your know, lights are going on and, and all the lights would start coming yeah. on as you drive it's very, very fun when it's about, you know, 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning and you're turning everyone's sensor lights on. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, one of my buddies at work is like, hey, you're into that ham radio stuff, right? And I'm like, yeah. And, and he said that his garage door just opens and shuts and he can't, he can't figure out what it is. And he lives in a, in a pretty densely populated area. So he, I went onto the website like ham map or whatever mm -hmm. it is, typed his address in and got a map of all the ham radio operators around him, which I was surprised at how many there were. And I was like, just because this says an operator lives at this house doesn't mean that they're currently operating, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I said, your best bet's to look around and see if you see any antennas or any of that kind of stuff. He was not able to track it down, but he was able to change the frequency in his garage door opener. Mm -hmm. Like you have dip switches in your garage door opener that have to correspond with your garage door fob, uh, and you, you can change those. Like, uh, and what I told him is, is I actually lived in the townhouse community and I was sitting there watching TV, and all of a sudden I heard my garage door open. And I'm like, what was that? And it turns out my neighbor, he bought the exact same garage door opener from the <laughs> Home Depot or whatever, and his was set to the same frequency, so we had to, we had to change them. Yeah. I, uh, I've got a couple of stories like that too. Um, the, the garage door opener, we had a beacon, a, set, a UHF beacon, which was uh, operating, a CW beacon. And the problem was is that, the location where the beacon was was where a garage door was and the homeowner would come home and they couldn't open the garage door because the beacon was overpowering the signal from the little <laughs> from the little remote control in the vehicle so what they had to do is they had to um not transmit all the time from the beacon but have a short break in between each uh, each transmission right. so that there was enough time to turn the and and the morse code was really really quick so that 
they could they you know if I'll press it once, just wait a minute and then press or wait you know five yeah. seconds and then press it again. Well, the beacon was probably transmitting dead air, right? Because they just yeah. probably just made a recording and just kept playing the recording on loop as opposed to yeah. actually. So so that was the first one. The second one was a repeater uh, interference issue that we had, and again it was UHF. The problem is, is here in at least in Australia, we've got a what we call a low interference low interference potential devices band, which mm. is your common garage door openers, um, anything that's that only requires a really really small amount of power to control something. So like a remote to control a a light or to control the garage or to turn something on and off. Um, they all put it in this band, and it just so happens that it's the same. It, it resides in the same input frequency band as all the 70 centimeter repeaters in Australia. Now, mm. it's not that much of a problem because it's only a very short, small, narrow frequency range and you can still um, you can still avoid that by uh, when you're designing a repeater, you can avoid that frequency input and then you won't have that issue or you can have you know other things like CT, CSS tones to trigger right, right. the repeater. But we had a problem whereby not everyone knows the Australian rules, especially things that come out of China or from America. And we had this, we had this, uh, we had a fishing vessel. And what happened was, is they had a remote control that operated a crane on the fishing vessel. And the channel that they'd used in it was smack bang on the same frequency as our repeater input. And what would happen was, is the fishing vessel would go down the channel. And you would hear sure. the interference. You would hear the re- interference on the repeater. It was strong as anything, Brrr, just <laughs> constant data. And it was because right. the, the guy was operating the crane. And what ended up happening was, is as soon as they went around the point and out of view of the uh, repeater, because right, it was fine, low power, it would come fine. <laughs> and we sat there and we're like, "What on earth is it?" So what we used to do is myself and another amateur friend we would have on our in in our radios because we had dual receive so we'd have the repeater on one frequency and we'd have the input on the other frequency and it just so happens that i was driving one day uh near where the port was and i heard it and the interference come up and it was on the repeater and it was also on um the uh input Mm. and i i couldn't narrow down which boat it was because so you, you were hearing it on the repeater output on one channel, but you were also hearing it on the repeater input because you were monitoring that. Yeah. So then what I did was the repeater input is I tried to see if I could get as close as I could to figure out, you know, which vessel it might be, but I couldn't. <laughs> so, speeding around. Were you in that little the, van that you use for the club, yeah. the club van? <laughs> but, the, but the good thing is, is that I knew that it was a fishing vessel. So that eliminated a whole bunch of things. So I knew that sure. that was the problem. So then what I did was I I knew roughly where it was. So what I did was I waited until it and I know, I knew roughly where the where they used to go, where the boats used to go. So I kind of surmised where it was and what I did was one day we got we, we the interference come up again so we raced off in it and and went down to where the fishing vessel was it wasn't there mm. and I, or, or the the it, the interference wasn't in the same spot as I was. So I thought, okay, the boat must be out. So I drove further down the point and there's this little beach that you can sit on. And on one side, you've got the point uh, of uh, like the point of the, where the, the fishing vessel goes around. And on the other direction, you've got another point. So it, it's ideal. It's like in this little bay. Right. And I sat there and I watched as the fishing vessel come <laughs> around the point the interference on the input come up and then he went around and he went down around the other point and the interference disappeared. And you got and it on tape. You're like, crikey, I got it on, I got it on footage. <laughs> no, no. Well, the worst part was, is the fishing vessel was too far out that I couldn't see what the name of the, the vessel was. But I went, I went to Marine track, tra- uh, tracking and I got <clears> the name and we ended up reporting it and, and the, uh, the, the, the inspector come out and they change the frequencies and they they fixed it all up. But anyway, that's a long side point to to try and it's it's all it's all relative to trying to find QRM, trying mm-hmm. to find a process of elimination, trying to find what the source of the problem is, and then going off and resolving it. So um, half the battle is trying to find the source in the first place. Yeah. Now, if you think it's like your neighbor, the, the neighborly thing to do is to go over and talk to them and say, "Hey, I think that this is 
a problem and here's why now, your neighbor might be like hey buzz off uh, or mm -hmm. bugger off is what they say down there um or, you know they might say that or they might say yeah let me take a look and, and work with you most of the time when you go accusing somebody of something that they have no conceptual understanding of they're going to get upset mm -hmm. right um mm -hmm. so that that's something that's going to happen but but with your in case with this fishing boat you did the right thing i think calling the authorities you know, because if you went down there and you're like, hey, you're interfering with my repeater op, you could have ended up being bait. Well, actually, no. So what we end up, what we did do is, is it did come into the port and we wanted to double make sure because we didn't know what device it was obviously on the boat. So what we did was they come in and we went down to the dock and I had my handheld there and my buddy was with me and we said to them, hey, um, we, 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 we explained we've got this radio device and we've just been trying to track down this interference. And we said... We noticed that it must be coming from the fishing vessel and we said is there anything that you've been that's new or that you've been using and they said no no there's nothing and as we were standing there the 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 crane started to move and i could see the guy you could the see the right and then it disappeared as the crane stopped and i said that's the problem the, the problem is the crane right and the guys were like, oh, they're like, yes, it, that got installed, but it had a console that you could plug in. <laughs> so you could plug it in or it would do wirelessly. So that's why it was there sometimes and not others. In the end, well, they were pretty good, but we didn't sort of accuse them of interference or anything. We just said, oh, that must be a problem device. And they were like, yeah, that's fine. We'll right. do anything to fix it. So, Because yeah, like, uh, you know, in the United States, you go to one of these mob controlled ports. And uh, you know they're gonna they're gonna throw you in the water. Uh, just, yeah, probably feed you to that, the, right? feed you with the fishes. Yeah, give um, you concrete shoes. <laughs> right, right. Somebody's around here making trouble. Uh, 